Kia ora, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. My name's Francis Cook. I'm the Investments Editor at Business Desk. Now we have a great Business Desk special for listeners and viewers. You can find out about that at the end of this episode. But before we get started, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Today, we're joined by independent economist Tony Alexander to talk property, get an update on the state of our housing market. Welcome, Tony. Thanks very much for having us in again, Francis. Oh, always an absolute delight. I mean, first of all, just want to double check. We've obviously had some shocking weather recently. I'm hoping that you and all your loved ones are okay. Well, we're okay. I'm north of Wellington, but um, I've been out here for 30 years, so I'm used to the weather out here. And starting about three and a half years ago, uh, the rain when it would fall would be extra strong. It's caused some slips. I've had to spend $8,000 lifting up a culvert in the driveway um, because the bottom one got blocked up by a slip. And coincidentally, uh, just two hours after we record this, Francis, I've actually got a meeting with the council on my road um, so they can have a look at the culvert up there. And as as to why is all this water on the road now coming down my property? So yeah, climate change, I, I think it's impacting here north of Wellington, uh, not to the same extent as other parts of the country. It's already costing me some money. And of course, this is one of the things that's going to underpin inflation for a great number of years, climate change, essentially. Yeah, yeah. The, the delights of being a homeowner is that you are then, of course, on the hook for things like an $8,000 culvert bill. Love that for you. Yes, that's such as life, exactly. I mean, when, and especially if you've got a lifestyle block, then you don't buy it to live a, a relaxed lifestyle. Um, you're living a life sentence. <laughs> yeah, poorly named. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, look, we've, we've started off on a slightly grim note, but let's just get this grim stuff out of the way, right? I mean, we had um, the Reserve Bank last week. They released their biannual financial stability report, which sounds very dry, but Lord, there was a lot in it that's going to impact all of us. So they said house prices were, quote, closer to being at sustainable levels than has been the case in recent years. I mean, translation, prices have fallen to a level that's more in touch with reality, but maybe they think still a little overvalued. I mean, let's start with this idea of a sustainable price. Do we even know what that looks like? No, not at all. I, I still come across frequently people who think, oh, we have to get back to average house prices being where they should be at three times income, which generally was the case up until the very early 1990s. And what I, I say to them is we are never going back to that level again. I mean, for, for one reason, interest rates tend to be lower uh, these days than was the case previously, 1980s, etc. But also the cost of new houses being built added to the housing stock. There's no comparison with the old days. Uh, they've got insulation in the walls. Um, there's further insulation requirements coming along uh, all the time. Uh, health and safety measures for the people when they're working on the site, scaffolding going around the, uh, the buildings, extra inspections from the council, the cost of the land, the consenting fees, etc. So the, the cost of additions to the housing stock, completely different from in the past. And you know, that's just one of the reasons why uh, whatever this sustainable ratio is of house prices versus incomes these days. It's not going to be remotely like it was you know, three decades ago. But whether we're there now or we'll be there in 12 months time, it, that's actually fairly subjective. I just take it as it comes. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and the further comments from the Reserve Bank that maybe prices could fall below whatever these sustainable levels are. I mean, below even what the Reserve Bank thinks is a more realistic price. That almost sounds like they're predicting the possibility of a crash. I mean, what did you make of those comments? Uh, I think they were simply backtracking from some comments made a couple of weeks earlier by another Reserve Bank official uh, in relation to the easing of the LVR requirements that are coming up there. House prices have undergone a substantial decline. They're not as overvalued away from you know, reality as was the case previously. They are far more relaxed about the uh, risky profile, the lending of the banks um, out there. I actually think they were just backtracking from those comments that people might have interpreted as the Reserve Bank now says house prices are sustainable, let's press go. 
and start jumping into the market again. So I actually think that was a bit of a motivating factor there. Um, I do not see the fundamentals that I look at, migration flows, interest rate outlooks, uh, income growth, all those things, as saying, nah, we're only halfway through the house price decline. I think we've done the bulk of the house price decline for this cycle. We're near the bottom, but I've really got no idea what month it is going to have run in. Mm, it certainly has that feeling, doesn't it, that it feels like some of those fundamentals that were pushing prices down might be easing off. I mean, what are some of the fundamentals that you keep an eye on and how have they changed recently? Okay, yeah, there's quite a few things that are in play there. So let's start with the big one, which I still don't think people have caught up on, but it's going to hit them like a truck at some point. And that is the net migration flow for New Zealand a year ago was a loss of 20,000 people. Now, on the day where we're doing this, it was a gain in the year to February or March, we're up to a 52,000. And it's going to go higher than that. That's a 1% boost to the population, therefore spending in the economy, therefore demand for accommodation. And so that population growth at some stage, I use these three words quite often, at some stage, people will recognise population growth is surging. I know what that means for the housing market, but we're not there yet. It looks like maybe interest rates have peaked. They're already down 0.7% for fixed rates of three, four and five years. At some stage, people are going to go, that's the worst on interest rates. They're going to go down, not in a hurry, but I'm not as fearful of prices as I was uh, uh, before. At some stage, people are going to realise the listings are going down. The stock of listings of properties I can look through, it's certainly higher, uh, about double what it was in 2021, but it's already down 11% from its peak. And at some stage, people are going to go, I wonder if there's going to be a shortage of listings again, you know, come 2024. We put those things together and other things such as um, the, the the migration surge and properties going back to Airbnb, etc. It's starting to tighten up the rental market. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned there was like the number of listings, right, which is really important. One of the things that typically happens when house prices fall, people hold off selling if they can. So can I get a bit more depth from you in terms of what are we seeing in terms of the listings that are happening and also buyer demand? What is the interaction there? And if you could, yeah. you know, put put your, your crystal ball in front of you and where do you think it's going? Yeah, this one is going to be exceedingly interesting in the coming few months or let, let's say maybe 12, 15 months uh, or so. So in the middle of 2021, the number of properties listed for sale fell to a record low 13,000. 500 shortage, FOMO all over the place, prices price rising. Uh, but now at the end of December, so I'm going back what, four, five months now, at the end of December, the number of listings was about 28, I think almost 29,000. But we're already down to the end of April, 25,800. So like I say, an 11% decline. Now, sure, when the market picks up, some of the many vendors who are just not bothering putting the property on the market will step forward. But I've had a look at what happens with listings when sales pick up. So you know, more activity uh, for the real estate agents, listings go down. And so that's why I'm saying we've probably seen the peak in listings and now they start going down. And that's interesting in itself. Not as interesting, however, as on the buyer side, where since let's go early 2021, there have been people who want to buy, maybe have been able to buy going, yeah, nah, this market's going crazy. There's not much to choose from. And I wonder if prices are going to fall. I'm going to wait and see what happens. And then, of course, from December 2021, January 2022, with house prices falling, no shortage of people say, this is going down. Why would I buy when prices are going to go lower? So there's up to two years worth of buyers queued up waiting for solid signs that the market has bottomed out and they're going to move into the market and I think the volume there uh, is going to be far greater than the number of delayed vendors you know who have held off putting their properties on the market so you know that falls on the side of when the cycle turns properly and it's going to take an interest rate component there to, to really do it there is the risk of maybe a little bit of a blip upward in the prices there which surprises might surprise a few people yeah, yeah, I, I think so as well. I think when things turn, there's a possibility it could turn quite quickly. Like you say, the interest rate factor is huge here. It seems to be that everyone is predicting a uh, 0.25 uh, lift next time around. And then 
maybe hold steady for a while there. What's your prediction of what we might see over the next year or so with interest rates? Yes, yeah, I think we are near the peak. So maybe there's another quarter of a percent left on uh, May uh, 24. Partly that will depend upon how stimulatory uh, the government's budget is on May 18. So that's an unknown uh, quantity to factor in there. Uh, And there are arguments for thinking, oh, but rates might go higher versus no, that's going to be the peak. The argument for rates going higher would be not only probably a bit of uh, fiscal stimulus, but the tight labour market. Businesses are pessimistic. They say they're going to lay off staff and the the various surveys out there, and then they go and hire more people. Job numbers grew 0.8% in the March quarter, 0.5% December quarter. Job numbers 2.4% ahead of a year earlier. The unemployment rate's still down at 3.4%. Job security is good. That means consumer spending is holding up surprisingly well. But offsetting that sort of upward pressure on inflation is the fact that the bulk of the interest rate increase impact on consumer spending is only just starting because you've got about $170 billion worth of fixed rate mortgages are now going from 3.5% to 6.5%, something like that. So there's that extra restraint to come along. And the Reserve Bank will be wary of tightening too much because of that big lag defect still to come through. So my main comments would be, I guess, twofold. Number one, I think we're pretty close to the peak for interest rates generally, and we already have seen the peaks, I think, for two to five five years. But people shouldn't expect rapid declines once the downward movement starts, because there are these various factors underpinning inflation. And we we already mentioned one right at the start there, climate change, extra costs, uh, insurance costs, those sort of things. Yeah, you mentioned there about the delayed impact. Um, New Zealanders love a one or two year fixed rate mortgage. So a lot of mortgages due to refix soon that will be feeling the impact of these higher interest rates all at once. I mean, when do you think we'll really start to see that biting? Well, in terms of you know, cutting back on consumer spending, I think going through winter. I mean, the weather's bad enough or, or already, even though it's been relatively warm. But uh, I think for retailers, the outlook's uh, pretty challenging there because so many people are going to have their cash outflows jumping with servicing the mortgage payments. People are going to be cutting back on domestic, international travel. Uh, I can see all this in my monthly spending plan survey that it's all looking newly ugly, that just in the past four weeks, people's outlook for the economy, their spending plans um, has freshly uh, deteriorated. So there is more of that pain um, to come through. And you know people are going to have to be looking at uh, where they can save some of their expenditure. But also just be aware that with the rental market tightening up, there's an opportunity to take in a border, which tended not to exist in previous uh, high interest rate periods. And also uh, plenty of jobs if you want to work at the weekend in the hospitality sector or whatever to supplement your income. So that's quite different uh, from a household budgeting point of view compared with previous cycles. Hmm, really good points there. There's a couple of rule changes also. Um, and you've mentioned one already. I'd love to get into a bit more depth on these. Let's start with the one happening soonest, the LVR uh, rates, uh, which for anyone who hasn't been keeping an eye on this, loan to value ratios, basically how much deposit do you need? Um, and these LVR changes uh, will mean in a very short sense that more buyers with a small deposit could be able to get approved for a mortgage, but still really high deposit requirements for investors, even though that's eased off just a smidge. So what impact is that having? Will those changes have? What do you make of it? Yeah, I think there will be a positive impact in terms of more people looking to make a purchase or becoming eligible for a purpose because banks will be able to uh, have more low deposit loans uh, than was the case previously and investors only needing maybe 35% deposit instead of 40% from uh, June uh, 1. And I can see uh, from my monthly survey of mortgage advisors underway at the moment, uh, they are revealing an increase just in the past four weeks in first home buyers in the market and a few more investors as well. But I personally think the investors are largely going to remain out of the market as buyers, as they have done since the end of March 2021 with the tax changes and, and now with interest rates at new highs. I think a lot of them are simply going to wait to see what the election does and if there is a change in taxation policy um, before they make any hard decisions. So I think the the market is still relatively open for the first home buyers if they can service a test interest rate of 9%. 
um, to make a purchase, uh, to go to the auction rooms, still without much competition from the investors. But you see, that could change later on this year. Mm. So is that the way you're you're picking the market in terms of favorability? Better for first home buyers right now than investors? Oh, it has been since uh, March, well, 27, when those rules became effective in 2021. I can see from my surveys of the mortgage advisors, uh, consumers of the real estate agents, right at the end of March 2021, the investors just disappeared as buyers and they have not come back. Uh, and it's at the moment, uh, the interest rates going up is a problem for them. And as each year goes by, there's less of their interest expense they can deduct against uh, rental income. And if you pick up any uh, rental property uh, investment book over the past uh, two, three, whatever decades in New Zealand, every single one has highlighted how you use debt a little bit of accrued equity and whatever you've got, and then get more debt to hop to the next property and build and build from there. Well, the finance minister has reasonably successfully shattered that model from March 2021. And so while that means for cashed up investors, and there's plenty out there, it doesn't really change all that much. For those who have used that model, um, it just doesn't exist any longer. So that's quite a change out there. That's a huge change. Um, And in terms of the other rule change that I want to chat about, the debt to income ratios looking likely to come in from March next year as well. And again, for for a very short description for those who haven't been paying attention to that, basically, you couldn't take on debt that is more than a certain multiple of your income. Now, what might this look like? What hints has the government given us of this rule change and what impact could that have? Yes, the the Reserve Bank has done some research and and their view is that there won't be all that much impact on the young buyers and it will predominantly hit through to the investors. The Reserve Bank have not really given any strong hint as to what the multiple uh, will be, whether it's a maximum five times your income for your total debt, mortgage, credit cards, personal loans, etc., or whether it's six times or whether it's seven times. All we have is an instruction from the government from early 2021 that we Whenever the Reserve Bank implements these sort of uh, credit control policies, uh, they try to improve the, uh, the the ground, as it were, for first home, home buyers. And so there may be there, there could be different ratios for first home buyers versus investors. We simply don't know, but it looks highly likely that these will come in uh, the DTIs uh, from sometime uh, next year, maybe about a year uh, from now. But before then, we could even see a little bit further easing. Um, of the LVR rules there. And we've got to remember that these rules are not used by the Reserve Bank to try and drive house prices or even necessarily try and get more first home buyers in the uh, in the market there. They are driven by their perceptions of the riskiness of bank lending, of the vulnerability of bank lending to either a sharp increase in interest rates, a uh, sharp increase in the unemployment rate, uh, a sharp rise, uh, uh, like I say, interest rates, unemployment rate, uh, a fall in house prices. So that's really what's driving them rather than them trying to target house prices as such. Mm. I mean, investors obviously um, having a slightly tough time at the moment. What other factors would investors need to take into account if they were considering hoping to be involved in the market? I mean, you've already mentioned things like migration, the labour market. Those are the sorts of things they should be keeping an eye on? I think definitely keep an eye on that. And also, uh, I guess the rents, um, I can see from one of my monthly surveys uh, with Crocker's Property Management, I, I, I get insight into what the residential property investors are thinking there. And the investors are finding it easier to get good tenants. I think partly that's the migration surge uh, uh, having a role there. Uh, The foreign students coming into New Zealand, highly relevant to Auckland CBD and inner city there as well. The tourism sector are recovering. uh, So properties going back out of the long-term rental pool they went into in first half of 2020. um, And now they're going back towards Airbnb. We've got the Chinese tourists yet to come back again. So there's sort of an extra transfer that's going to uh, occur there. And also something else that's going to be developing the next two to three years, which is a fall in new house 
supply. At the moment, we've had you know big growth in house construction in New Zealand for over a decade, but now we've got the builders falling over, the numbers don't stack up any longer, people have become wary of signing up in some cases for off-the-plan purchases, uh, the bank willingness to finance multi-unit developments has, has pulled back. So the flow of new property coming forward is going to be a bit more constrained in the next three years than people might be thinking at the moment. And I guess from an investor point of view, um, do look, I guess, favourable towards the uh, requirement for extra social housing in New Zealand. Uh, you know, liaise with uh, um, uh, Kayanga Ora there about uh, what their requirements are. They are buyers of multi-unit developments, uh, etc. So yeah, don't be afraid, I think, of getting into that pool there. Look at the growing sector of build to rent. It's large in the UK, it's growing in Australia, and these are early days in New Zealand. So you know, investors simply have to see the way that, I guess the ground has shifted a little bit there, but from a taxation point of view, there is still the retention of interest deductibility for, for new builds and, like I say, on the uh, social housing side as well. What about for the first home buyers? Because I feel like they've been on the sidelines for a long time crying foul that it's been really hard um, and totally appreciate that it has been really hard for many first home buyers. Um, if they're looking at this and thinking, now might be my opportunity, but interest rates are so high. And as you say, a lot of buyers standing back and saying, well, maybe prices will fall a bit more and maybe I could get a bargain if I hold off more. You know, if you were having a frank, honest conversation with a first home buyer right now, uh, what would be your assessment of the market for them and what should they be keeping an eye on? Yeah, yeah, I think um, my assessment would be we are near the bottom. I don't know when the bottom month is going to be and you certainly don't know when the bottom month is going to be. But just keep in mind that you're looking to make your first home purchase. You're looking for a place where you're going to make your stand where you're going to raise your family, et cetera, and you're probably going to be having that pace, place for 5, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years or so. Uh, and in 5, 10, 20 years, it really isn't going to matter at all if you were able to make the purchase at you know $895,000 or what you paid of $915,000. It'll get completely lost in the wash. There's a window of opportunity, which has been there for a while now, of making a purchase without all the other investors or investors in the auction rooms and tenders, etc. Et the listings are plentiful, but there's a clock ticking. And at some stage, the listings are going to be falling away. The two-year queue of people generally is going to be coming back into uh, the market. The FOMO will start going up. And FOOP, fear of overpaying. I, I, I've, I've got the only measures of two of these things, of these two things um, in the country there. They're going to switch around. Fear of overpaying, prices falling is up here. FOMO is near zero that's going to change at some stage, potentially, I think, brutally in the next 12 months. So the clock is ticking. And if it was one of my kids in this sort of financial position able to do so, I would basically be suggesting maybe you want to um, you know, pick three properties that suit your per purposes and uh, put in some reasonable bids. Um, just for your guide, people are, are putting in a lot of silly bids and insulting vendors. There's actually a, a great number of first home buyers who are actually missing out on good properties because what they're submitting is a bit of an insult and the vendor won't bear it. So just watch out for that one would be a little bit of advice I'd, I'd, I'd get. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because of course you want to negotiate, of course you want to get a good bargain. But if you come in way too low, if you come in at an insulting level, then the whole thing might be off the table. It's such a balance, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, you've got to be careful because uh, yeah, we Kiwis, we, we chin don't we don't like somebody looking like they're up themselves. And even if I've had my property on the market for nine or 12 months, if somebody comes in with a ridiculously low offer, I think they're well up themselves thinking that I'm that desperate that I've simply got to sell. No, nope, I'm not going to sell. Damn it, we're going to stay here in this place for another two years, Myrtle. That's the attitude one risks. So be, be careful with one's uh, uh, offer. <laughs> Never upset Myrtle, you're done for. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I'd like to touch on, because we, we've got into it a little bit, but I'd like to get into more depth, is the mortgage market really does have a huge impact on the housing market because that is the way that almost everyone buys a house, right, is you have to get approved for a mortgage unless you are extremely lucky. There's not that many people around like that. So when we're looking at all of these interest rates, the LVR, the DTI changes, how much 
does all of that have knock-on impacts through the housing market? Uh, well, well, definitely strong knock-on impacts. Obviously, the tax changes for the investors in March 2021 took them out of the, the market. So there's sort of a long-term impact going on there. The interest rates, well, they're, I guess, the killer at the moment. That There might be people who have actually got a deposit, be it 10, 15, 20%. Uh, but uh, with the interest rates being tested by banks, 8.5%, 9%, some I think are a, li- a little bit more, the numbers are not going to stack up in terms of your uh, repayments of principal and interest, you know, being more than whatever the banks are using at the moment, 30 or 33 percent of income. When the interest rates come down, then purchase will become a lot more eligible for a lot of people um, out there. I think that the deposit doesn't seem to be the biggest issue for a lot of people now because they've been saving up money. Uh, wages have actually grown 17, 17% on average from where they were three uh, years ago. The house price has fallen away 24% in Wellington, 22% in Auckland, sort of 17% the, the country overall. So th- these measures are sort of moving around. And one which interests me, but I don't. I don't run solid numbers on it, would be, well, the rents are going up, but the house prices are, are, are coming down. This dynamic is shifting uh, out there, and I think people need to uh, sort of keep an eye um, on, on that one. So, yeah, these things really, really matter, and for the moment, the interest rates in particular are preventing a lot of people from uh, buying, but those, those rates are going to come down. The banks are... Uh, what matters also is the willingness of banks to uh, be generous in their interpretation of triple CFA rules, all that sort of thing. And I do believe that about three months ago, the Reserve Bank probably got on the phone calling up the banks and saying, you're heavily discounting some of your one and two year mortgage rates. We don't think that's very helpful, given the restraint we're trying to put on the market out there, because the likes of one bank had 4.99% for one year. It didn't last very long. I think they were sort of clipped around the year and told, don't do that. Well, at some stage when the Reserve Bank sort of eases off and says, we get happier about inflation, uh, then I'd expect the banks to reintroduce some specials. Maybe spring. Keep an eye out for spring specials. Oh, okay. The flip side of that, of course, um, so far, most of the banks seem relatively confident, relatively happy, limited signs that people are running into trouble with their mortgage and what they call distressed lending. Um, Notable exception there, I think, in a recent result from Westpac, some signs of more distressed loans. But for the majority, it seems to be better than it could be. Um, What are the undercurrents here? Is there much risk of people being unable to pay their mortgage in New Zealand and seeing these forced sales of people who've lost the house? I don't think the risk is very high, especially of the forced sales. I think mortgagee sales are going to be relatively low this cycle uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, Number one, job security is high. Uh, The unemployment rate is still only 3.4%. Businesses would like to lay people off to save expenses, but they can't do it because if they lay the staff off, they know they're not going to be able to replace them when the economy picks up, you know, 12 months down the track. So there's good job security, so good income. People can continue to uh, maybe get some extra work, part-time work if they want at the weekend. Those opportunities um, exist. There has been good wages growth, uh, like I say, 17% growth on average average from three uh, years ago. And that's important when we consider that uh, only now are we sort of into the period when the interest rates people are going to be paying, let's say 6.5%, are above what they were tested at when they took out the mortgage, uh, you know, two, three or so years ago. And so some will be paying more than they had to prove that they could actually pay back, you know, two years ago. But their incomes have risen over this period uh, of time. So I'm not concerned about a great wave of uh, distressed sales uh, going through the market. And I'm, I'm highly convinced the banks will do all they can to prevent it. Uh, it's bad PR um, if, they, if they do that. And uh, they'll look to work with, their, pe- with uh, their customers. As long as they can continue to service the debt, then they'll look to keep them in the house uh, as best as possible. Yes, I think banks are quite conscious of their social license at the moment, given that there has been so much talk about profits Mm. and um, how they're operating. I think they are well aware that the threat of some new regulations hangs over their heads. So they probably don't want then a bunch of mortgagee sales. Um, Not a great look. Um, If the property market does remain challenging, 
Are investors looking for other places to park their money? Are you seeing much of that? Uh, I guess I've been seeing bits of that uh, ever since, you know, the rule change from the government for the for the investors from early uh, 2021. Uh, but of course, the issue here is that the investors who have traditionally got into residential property have done it using debt. Not many people will be able to go along to the bank and say, can you lend me $800,000 because I want to invest in a diversified por- portfolio? Uh, whereas that happens with residential property or, or to a lesser extent commercial property market as well. So the actual transfer of those investors into other things is a bit less than one might think looking at some of the traditional investor numbers for uh, buying residential property. But certainly I think a lot of the fear about share markets falling away, I, I think it disappeared uh, a wee while ago. Sure, the banking sector ructions in the United States are something for people to focus on, but a lot of the weeding out and adjusting of the tech sector to overstaffing during the pandemic, you know, going back down the other way. Uh, a lot of that process seems to have run itself uh, through there. Obviously, there's new innovations with AI out, out there. People are still interested in crypto as well, Bitcoin price relatively high off its lows at the moment uh, as well. So I think people are more aware of the alternatives. They've simply had to become more aware because residential property numbers are now different with the different tax regime than was the case previously. And of course, with interest rates being relatively high, uh, many investors are simply going to think, well, actually fixed interest uh, securities, not too bad. Even term deposits, not too bad at the moment. So yeah, I think there is active interest in, out there in, in finding some some alternatives. Mm. Okay, we're pretty much at the end, but over the next 12 months, let's finish on. What do you see coming as a highlight and a low light? <laughs> as a highlight and a, and, a, and a low light. It often depends upon what side of the equation you, you are on, uh, looking to buy something or looking to, to sell something. Uh, highlight, uh, hopefully more adjustment to climate change and its impact there and extra determined by the government to focus on infrastructure and the local authorities as well. So I'm hopeful of some accelerated change there basically to recognise what climate change is doing. And we all have to recognise that in portfolios that one might be building up as well, vulnerability of one's uh, home circumstances uh, uh, as well. Um, on the low light uh, side, difficult to say because I'm definitely a glass half full person. <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess I would keep an eye on the house prices potentially bumping up before some young buyers have sort of recognised what is happening out there. And then is that risk, like I say, the listings could fall away relatively quickly spring through summer later on this year. So for first home buyers, just keep an eye on that. Be aware there has not been a flood of property coming on the market from the investors. And I still think uh, there, there, there won't be. The clock is ticking on this period of you've got not much competition out there. The listings are going to dry up at some stage, maybe within the next 12 months. Keep an eye on that one. Yes. And speaking of clock ticking, look, I know we get a lot of questions about this. So I'm just squeezing in one last one. Um, People often want to know, should they be fixing if they are lucky enough to have a mortgage, lucky enough to be a homeowner? uh, Should they be looking at one year, two year, five years? You know, do you have a thought on what are some of the best rates around right now? And especially given if interest rates might change in the future, what sort of strategies people should be looking at there? Right, you certainly can't give advice here, but if I were borrowing at the moment, I would be in the space of uh, one year, 18 months, maybe for for two years. My gut tells me one year because I expect weakness in the economy, inflation easing off, monetary policy easing, you know, through 2024, 2025. So the incentive is to roll, you know, short there, uh, which has been the best strategy since 2009. It's given you the lowest cost, simply rolling one year fixed religiously. But the danger here is people are going to go, yeah, but the one year rates are about 679. I can fix three or five years at 599 that's cheaper. I'll do that. No, you're near the top of the cycle. I wouldn't touch those rates with a barge pole because if the yield curve is sloped like that, uh, high short-term rates, lower long-term rates, it says these rates are falling away. So I I use that term. I wouldn't touch the five-year rate with a barge pole in 1998. And in 2008, and over two years ago, I said, I'm going to be using it again. Uh, I'm using it now. I would be taking the short-term pain of one year or 18 months or maybe a little bit of two year because, after all, none of us have any economic models that work 
any longer in this uncertain world. Yes, exactly. I mean, it tells you that the bank expects interest rates to fall again. But uh, of course, things can always change. And this is why we say we can't give you financial advice. We can only tell you what it looks like at the moment. Mm, definitely. And things can change. And, and just be aware, um, they, they will change. We don't know exactly what's going to come along in the next uh, in a few months. And uh, whatever the election outcome is going to be, don't even know that, for instance. <laughs> Oh, exactly. And election years are always huge for unexpected curveballs, which means I love them from a professional point of view, but from a personal point of view, it can be interesting, can't it? (laughs) Yeah, quite a challenge. (laughs) Thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. A big thank you to Tony Alexander for joining us, sharing your insights today. Really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Francis. Bye-bye, everybody. And of course, we do have a special offer for Sharesies investors from Business Desk. If you want to stay up to date, use the promo code SHAREDLUNCH2023. You'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk. Bargain, it's usually $249, including GST. Now, this offer only applies to new Business Desk subscribers, can only be used once per subscriber, can't be used with any other discounts. Enjoy the rest of your week. Stay safe. 